Back around the time I was in middle school, let's say the mid 2010s, there is a very popular form of news story or viral social media post that would focus on a disabled student that was taken as a date to prom by an able bodied student, typically a popular sports captain in the high school. The prom would be transferred into a media event of sorts. The photo and headline of Football Captain Brings Special Education Student to Prom becoming a viral post retweeted by thousands, while local news outlets grasp at a chance to capitalize upon an easy feel good article. However, as a teenager coming to grips with his own autism, I felt very uncomfortable with these stories that popped up with increasing regularity on my social media feed. The objectification, the voyeurism, the necessary neglect of disabled people in order to prop up able-bodied individuals, it ate away at me. The power dynamics that I witnessed from the inside of my special education classroom were leaking onto the screen of my phone, and nobody cared to raise an objection to ask the unutterable question. What about the autistic prom queen who never received a quote in articles or a voice on Facebook? Does the disabled subject speak? Unfortunately, it is the state that offers the ultimate answer to that question, with the same dynamics that are in play the news story of the autistic prom queen being present within the halls of Congress. We see this in modern electoral politics, where disability as a political community is very rarely referenced, with disability politics being essentially non-existent at the national level since the passage of the ADA. In tandem with this lack of acknowledgement of disability issues by the state or national politics, an inertia has taken over disability discourse and activism, with movements of disability justice and protest becoming sequestered to online spheres, being deprived of a physical, in-person assembly. A central question then emerges out of this stagnation. Why have disability justice movements become isolated to the fields of social media? In answering this pressing question, an analysis of what can be termed as the politics of pity will yield the discovery that the investments of the social machine upon disabled subjects leads them into plugs of capital, with activism becoming a modern consumption specialized for today's virtual social media centric world. Rendering disability justice activism a production that creates flows of money, ultimately resembling a cog in a capitalist machine more so than a revolutionary vehicle of systemic change by which disability justice can be achieved. Thus, activism for disability rights sees all alterity and any potential of real change becoming entirely a politics of consumption. What are the politics of pity? This is the political manifestation of the charity model of disability where disabled subjects are constituted as objects of profit. This charity model can be seen in the example of prominent news stories where a disabled student is asked to school dance by an able-bodied individual. These news stories are written as feel-good stories where an able-bodied student, typically a captain of a sports team, would take a neurodivergent or physically disabled student to their high school prom as a date. Why was this of note? Why did consumers find these stories entertaining enough to justify more news stories and social media posts about bringing the disabled subject to prom to be produced? Perhaps because the disabled subject here was never humanized, but rather objectified as a figure of pity and charity, by which able-bodied individuals can be congratulated for merely treating them as the humans that they fundamentally are. This is the politics of pity invested in the social field, when the recognition of the disabled subject as fully human is immersed in a rationale of able-bodied self-interest through the constitution of people with disabilities as objects of charity, then it is fundamentally flawed and must be rejected. This same usage of the disabled subject as a charity case can also be seen in the workings of state politics, with the political machine utilizing the disability community as a political mascot by which politicians can show their supposed generosity or care for the average person. It is that state politics views disability rights as a charity case, in that by giving rights through a measure of goodwill, or, in other words, pity, the disabled subject will retreat through the marginal space allocated for them and be rendered what the person with disabilities always was to the state invisible. In the same way that the asking of the autistic to prom was never meant to humanize the disabled subject, but was rather meant to recenter the able-bodied individual as a person to celebrate, the state also utilizes disability politics as a show of generosity, as if to show that they do truly have the interest of the less fortunate at heart, thus improving how the average citizen views a politician. In other words, the disabled subject becomes a phenomenon of political PR. Thus. Disability politics on a national level takes on the theatrical character of a performance, for if they actually cared about disability rights, they would think longer about disability employment statistics, disproportionate rates of suicide, and social isolation. However, they do none of this, but utilize disability as a political mascot instead. 
The politics of pity was never meant to empower the object of pity, but rather to celebrate a person applying the pity. This utilization of the disabled subject as a charity case that performs as a political PR can be seen through an interaction between Samuel Habib and Joe Biden. Hi, Vice President Biden. I am a college student and I attended regular classes all the way through high school. How will you support more inclusive education for students with disabilities? Two things. We have a thing called the American Disabil Americans with Disabilities Act. We don't fund it. It will be fully funded in my administration. And you should be integrated into all of the classes because you're smart. You're smart, you're smart. The disability is not, does not define who you are. It doesn't define who you are. Well, God love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So proud of you. Presumptuous of me to be proud of you, but I am. Thank you. We appreciate that. Here, we can see Biden utilizing disability as a charity case, infantilizing Habib in an effort to show his humanity and ability to care for those generally considered less fortunate than him, mirroring the cultural logic of why able-bodied students were celebrated for taking an autistic student to prom. It would be bizarre to act in this way to an able-bodied individual, to say that you're proud of somebody after meeting that person for 30 seconds, and to repeatedly assert that the able-bodied individual is smart. However, because disability is a charity case, the infantilization of the disabled subject is accepted and is considered a sign of empathy and character, improving the public image of the politician while rendering the disabled subject as an object of pity. The utilization of the politics of pity then leads into a private disempowerment of the disabled subject. What happens in the Chamber of Congress is subsequently invested into the home of the average citizen. For the utilization of the disabled subject as a charity case, an idea is passed down from the political for the superstructure to lead able-bodied workers into the belief that systems are already in place to provide for the disabled subject, with the impoverishment of the disabled subject being obfuscated behind the disguise of the state's generosity. Here, the state replaces the role of the charity telephone. The presence of the disability telephone, by its own baseline logic, supposes an institutional framework that is already in place, and that all that is needed is a flow of money from consumer donations in order to help the subject of the telephone. The telephone then takes on a transactional nature, where in exchange for flows of money via donations, the individual donating subsequently derives pleasure from feeling like they have saved the subject of the telephone just for the act of donating. This in of itself is problematic, as it makes individuals feel that they have done something good, when the reality is that all they've done is give profit to a business group that will most likely improperly distribute the donations accrued by the telephone for their own benefit. However, when the state applies the politics of pity through the national government's role of providing for people with disabilities via SSDI, a role they fulfill very poorly, they go a step further. They take out the need for the consumer and assure the citizenry that there is no need for their donation. The state fulfills both the role of the telephone and the donor, providing both the flows of money and the infrastructure by which people with disabilities can be lifted up by the charity of the state. However, the state is both an incompetent charity structure and a lackadaisical donor. The disability institutions of the state are notoriously inefficient and underfunded, meaning that they play the role of both the consumer and donor while failing to be as successful as the telephone. This failure is intentional. By retrieving the role of being the caretaker of the disabled from the private sphere of the telephone, it pushes the impoverishment of the disabled subject outside of the public's eyes and prevents a disability politics from garnering popular, able-bodied support. This allows able-bodied citizens to completely forget the needs of the individual with disabilities and believe that the disabled subject is taken care of by the state, thus disempowering the push for disability rights by disability activists. What this application of the politics of pity ultimately does is make disability politics an immature political question, with everyday people responding with indifference to disability politics because they believe that people with disabilities are already provided for by the state. Thus, disability activism is disempowered, with the pleas of the disability advocate receiving a reply of a mass indifference. What then is the response of the disability activist? The answer of disability activism today is to retreat into the virtual, where the unique ideological divisions in social media gives disability activism a receptive audience they might not necessarily have access to within their own communities. However, this retreat into the virtual also plugs disabled subjects into outlets of consumption. Through the treatment of disability politics as a charity case, 
disability discourse is rendered infantile, leading disability activists into the false agency given by posting on social media, all while contributing revenue through advertisement consumption for these social media firms that translate online political action into flows of money. The disempowerment of minority discourses not only helps maintain the status quo, but also moves money into the pockets of capital, as disabled users of social media shout into the void and have their pain translated into profit. This is true even outside of the particular of social media. Because disability discourse is considered immature, again, charity cases should not be taken seriously, in the same way the autistic date is not taken seriously outside of their usage in relation to the able-bodied prom king or queen. Therefore, the only reaction is to eye for attempt of virtual activism, ultimately rendering social justice movements a consumptive process, or to give up a systemic critique in order to petition corporations to include disabled workers in wage labor. An act that constitutes people with disabilities as charity cases, where business must lift up these disabled adjuncts, attempting to return to the age of the telephone where the private sphere was responsible for the constitution of the disabled subject as an object of charity. Either way, the disabled subject plugs into flows of consumption, whether that be through social media or diversity inclusion seminars, employment coaches, resume workshops, and other means of commodified self-help that recenter able-bodied individuals, able-bodied businesses, and able-bodied structures of power while condemning disabled subjects to a consumption that propels the flow of money. Thus, disability activism is stripped of all revolutionary potential, with disability movements becoming apparatuses of consumption rather than vehicles that possess the potential to create real change. When disability movements are co-opted by social media conglomerates and disability workshops that translate disability to flows of money, turning disability advocacy into a phenomenon that is subsumed into the logic of capital, then the very process of attempting to create societal change then becomes an act of production. Thus, disability advocacy arrives at a conundrum where political action that is taken ends up being conciliatory to power, as it is translated into a capitalist profit as antithetical to the basis of disability activism within our current moment. The movements of activists pushed into action, intending to make public the private pain of disability, becomes a form of self-harm made with the best of intentions. Thus, disability advocacy arrives at a stagnation frozen by the politics of pity, choked out by the overcoating of the capital, and all that remains is the unutterable question posed before that remains unanswered by those that need to hear it the most. Does the disabled subject speak? Or does the politics of pity, enforced by the state, cover their mouth with a steady hand and speak for them? The answer is obvious, but recognizing the question itself is much, much harder.